through temptation. We saw how Joseph went through a hard hard time when he was when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife and how that she uh, came after him over and over and how but how that that Joseph remained faithful how that Joseph even though he was uh, he was under that temptation even though that things were were, were brought against him Joseph did not waver. Joseph remained faithful to God. And not only did he say that this would be a sin against you, not only would, would fall into this temptation be a sin against Potiphar, but mainly this would be a sin against God. And as we go through life, that's the way we need to look at it. It's bad that we hurt other people. It's bad that we do things that, that, that may bring effect on other people. But folks, when we sin whether it's against somebody or against something, it's all sin against God. And Joseph recognized that. But because he was lied on, because he did the right thing, but yet lies were told against him that put him in prison. And that takes us today to the next part of the story. This brings us today to the part of the story where we see that Joseph is put in prison. Now, as we... Um, if you if you're like me and, and most of us are we, we we grew up in Sunday school this is a story that that we could most of us could quote from end to end about Joseph we all know what happened in jo in Joseph's life so we know that today we're going to look at at what his life was like in prison what it was like for him while he was uh, while he was locked up so today we'll go to Genesis chapter 40. And it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of, G of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in the custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them so they were in custody for a while. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you this morning as we study your word. We thank you, Lord, that, number one, that you look after us, that you take care of us, and you watch over each and every one of us. And, Lord, we just thank you that, that you give us the opportunity to study your word, and, Lord, that you give us wisdom to, to interpret. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, if you'll notice here, we see two men. We see two men that are placed in prison for an offense. And we don't know what this offense is. We don't know what they've done. It, it does not tell us what they did. Uh, they could have uh, done something minor. It could have been something major. As I read the story and as you, as you understand it and you've read it in the past, you probably have come to the same conclusion that I did. The baker probably did something pretty major and the, the butler probably did something pretty minor. Um, but as we go through, I, I, I kind of tend to believe that the, the, the butler was, was innocent of his offense. But as we go through and we look at how this relates to us, and I look around us today, we are in a society where everybody is offended. We, we see this and we see that for something they did offended the king of Egypt. And I get so offended by people being offended sometimes. It's, it, it's come to the point that no matter what you do, you know right off the bat that somebody's going to find some sort of offense. I heard a joke one time, and, and I don't remember all how it goes, and it, it, but as you look at it, just think about how things have changed over 40 years. Uh, if, I, if I was a kid, and, uh, and, and a kid on a schoolyard, and there had happened to be a Muslim or a, a Jew who went to school with me. I don't know of any that there were, but if, that, if, there, if I had and I had told one of them, Merry Christmas, nothing would have been said. They would have said, okay, and walked away. 
That's just the way society was back then. If you got, if somebody says something that you didn't agree with, you okay. But today, if a if a child was to tell some a Muslim, or if they were to tell a Jew, and they were go up to them and say Merry Christmas, well, now we got to have. Uh, we got to have counseling for that kid because you've, you've bothered him, you've offended him, you've, you've done something that, that you know, it goes against his religion. So now we've got to, we've got to find, this kid's got to go to, to, to class now for, uh, because he's, he's done a hate crime and uh, he's got to go to insensitivity training. You know, it's just it's crazy what we go through today and how things have changed. Uh, you, you've got to watch out. It, it's like they, they want you to walk on eggshells because you might offend somebody. And I think it's so funny that we've got this, this society, this group of people who are so offended by everything, but yet they can, they can say anything they want to. They can, they can kneel during the national anthem and claim freedom of, of speech, no matter how many veterans, no matter how many patriots that that offends, they can do it because they have freedom of press or freedom of, of speech. But yet I, if, I, if I were to say anything about it, if I just, if, if I were to say I don't agree with it, then they're offended because I'm a racist. The thing is, is it, it, offense goes sometimes one way. They don't care if they offend me, but yet I'm not allowed to offend them. We're in a, in a world of, of everybody finds some sort of offense. And it's, it's a dangerous thing, though, when you've offended somebody like a king, especially in those days when the king of Egypt was all-powerful. If you offended him for anything, it could be a death sentence. Um, but as we go on, we look here, and I, and I want you to notice that during Joseph's time in, uh, in prison, he still found favor with God. God continued to bless Joseph while he was in prison. We see here that Joseph, even though he's in prison, he is charged by the captain of the guard. He is over the prison. Basically, whatever Joseph says in prison is what goes. He is, he is in charge. He, he has his way in prison. But even though he is in prison, he is in charge. He is, he's got the best position in prison. Let me to remind you of something. He's still in prison. He is still, uh, he still has lost his freedom. This is the man, though, has gone from the spot where, as at 17 years old, he was his father's favorite of a rich family uh, that, that you know, people feared. As, as the Israelites moved through the land, we know that, that others feared them because they knew that God's hand was on them. They, uh, they knew that they were, they were well, wealthy. Uh, other, other groups wanted to, uh, as they would move through the land, we know that, that other uh, people would want them to stay there because they knew how blessed they were. But yet we see Joseph go from that to being a slave to being imprisoned. Just because he was in charge of the prison didn't take him away from being a prisoner. I remember back when I was in the army, there was one time and I was, uh, I had a perfect record. I was, I, I was one of my drill sergeant's favorites. I, I was always, I, I, I went above and beyond things. I did, I did what I was supposed to do. I was where I needed to be. I kept my boots polished real good. I, I kept my uniform starched. I did exactly what I was supposed to do. But one night on a weekend, I had CQ guard and I overslept. Well, it was no big deal because my roommate was, he had the guard shift before me, so he, you know, he said, no, no problem, I'll just, rather than send somebody up to wake him up, I'll just cover his shift for him. Unfortunately, though, the drill sergeant came in and knew that I was supposed to be on guard duty and, and saw him there when I was supposed to be the one on guard duty. 
They had about five different people that weekend that didn't show up for guard duty, so he wrote me up. And uh, it was the only time I was ever in the, that I ever got, a, uh, got written up. The thing is, he came to me the next day and he said, I had to write you up. He said, because I wrote everybody else up, I didn't have a choice. I had to write you up. So here's what I want you to do. you got a week of extra duty. He said, but here's what I'm going to do. He said, here's a list of things that I need done. And there's going to be about 10 other people on extra duty with you. And this is your job. Your job is to make sure all this other stuff gets done. You're in charge of all the people on extra duty. So here I am. I'm, I'm the guy who is in charge of all those on extra duty. That's not too bad, except for the fact that I still had to be there. I was still on extra duty. I still didn't get to go running around with all my buddies. I still didn't get to go do the things that everybody else was doing. I had still lost my freedom for that week. Even though I wasn't the one who had to clean the toilet, I just had to tell which one of them to do it. I was still on extra duty. And that's the way I look at, at Joseph's life. He, he, he wasn't the one who was locked up in shackles and chains. He wasn't the one who was beating big rocks into little rocks. But he was still, did not have his freedom. He was still in prison. And for that reason, I mean, I can't imagine even being the one who was in charge he still would have been discouraged. Think about it. Think about even, even today, we, look at, we, we talk about people, you know, in prison today. You know, they've got air conditioning. They've got color TV. They've got all, they get three meals a day. They don't have to worry about what they're going to eat. They don't have to worry about paying health insurance and none of that stuff. They, they, but listen, they're still in prison. And, and I can imagine that it would be discouraging just the fact that he's lost his, um, all of his, his uh, freedoms going from where he was to where he is now. But we look at this and, and we see that now he's in charge of this, this baker and this butler. And as you go through the story, what I want you to notice is that, that one day Joseph comes in and he notices because he is a good he, he's a good man to be in charge he's the good uh, a, a good supervisor he notices that this baker and this butler are distraught he notices that there's something going on they notices that there's something wrong with them when he sees them in the morning so he asks them what has troubled you and we see that both of them had had a dream now I don't know about you all. I don't read a lot into my dreams. I, I don't remember most of my dreams. If I remember a dream, it's usually because I wasn't sleeping very sound or because maybe I ate something wrong or maybe I was just restless that night, whatever's on my mind. So I don't read a whole lot into my dreams. But back in those days, uh, and some people still do today, but back in those days, they put a lot of stock into their dreams. They, they thought that, that was, their dreams meant everything. And, and the places we see in the Scripture where people uh, were so concerned about their dreams were people who were not followers of God. Uh, we see it with, with, with this baker and butler. We'll see it later uh, next week with Pharaoh. We see it with Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. It's always those people, it seems like, who do not believe in God. They put more stock in their dream than they do in what God says. And, and therefore, they, they are so concerned about their dream. And here they, they have this dream, and they're, they're so upset about their dreams and they don't know what it means so they come to so Joseph comes to him and he says what does this you know or what's wrong with you they said we had a dream and no there's nobody to interpret our dream and I love what Joseph says he says nobody can interpret your dream because the interpretation of a dream is up to God. God is the only one who is capable of interpreting the dream. Now we see this twice uh, in the scripture. We see also that Daniel was in a similar situation. We see that Daniel um, 
was was asked by Nebuchadnezzar. They kept, and Nebuchadnezzar came and and he he was. Uh, he didn't only want the interpretation of his dream. He, wanted, he, he said, you tell me what my dream is so I'll know if you're for real or not. Daniel told him in chapter 2 of Daniel, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king because there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. See, Daniel made it plain. Secrets and, and dreams, they are up to the God in heaven. There is a God in heaven. Now remember, the, the people in Egypt, the people of the Chaldeans, the people of the Babylonians, they believed in lots of gods. But Daniel made it plain that there's a God in heaven who knows all. And that's what Joseph was, was telling this, this baker and this butler. I have a God. The God of the Hebrews, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. He knows all things. I can't tell you anything. No man can tell you what the dream means. But God in heaven can tell you. He can interpret the dreams for me. Now, I want you to think about this. Here is Joseph. Joseph is a man who is in prison. Who has fell from all that, all the glory, all the the opportunities, all that 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 he could have been, and for most people who was in the position that Joseph's in, who has gone from being a slave to now being in prison, I could imagine Joseph looking at the baker and the butler and saying, "Well, you all are just in trouble." Because God's forgot about me, and he's forgot about you. There is no hope, because God has left me here. I, I could just imagine Joseph telling him something like that. I can imagine me telling him something like that if I was in Joseph's situation. Well, you might as well just forget it. You're in trouble. God's left me here. He's the only one that could interpret a dream, and, and here we are. But that's not what Joseph did. Joseph looked at him, and he said... I can't tell you what your dream means. No man can tell you what your dream means. God only knows what your dream is. So go ahead and tell it to me. Here's Joseph who has presented these men and said, God knows your dream, but if you'll tell it to me, God may interpret it for you. Here is Joseph who remains faithful. Even though he is in the situation he's in, he has faith. He has trust that God will interpret these dreams for these men. And I want you to notice something else. These two men, they didn't believe in God. They were, they were not Christians. They were not, they were not Hebrews. But yet, when Joseph said, My God can interpret dreams... Tell them to me. You know what they did? They told him their dreams. You know why? Because God's hand was evident on Joseph's life. As we go through life, is it evident? Do people around you see evidence that God's hand is on your life? Because I'll tell you something, when, when it is evident to the people around you that God is working in your life, when, when, when it is evident to people around you that, that you are a follower of God, listen, people will come to you. People will ask you advice. People will ask you what you think this scripture means or what that scripture means. People will come up to you and say, you know, I've been having these problems. Would you pray for me? People that don't even know you, if they see that God is working in your life and they see God's hand on your life, I believe that, that Joseph, even though he was in this prison, and we don't know how long that they were there. It says they were there for a while. But we see that they probably noticed 
There's something different about this boy. There's something different about this man that's standing before us. He is in prison, but yet he holds on to hope. He's in prison, but yet he knows that there's a God in heaven. He's in prison, but yet he believes that this God can interpret this dream. So for that reason, I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him what my dream was and see what his answer is. And we know that the butler... He said, okay, I'll tell you my dream. My dream is, is that I, I was standing before a vine that had three branches. And I, I took the grapes off of this, this, I picked these ripe grapes and I squeezed them into this cup and I gave the cup to Pharaoh. And Joseph, which seems like a pretty, uh, pretty easy to interpret dream, but yet... This butler wasn't ready. He had already given up hope. I believe that this butler had given up hope because he was distraught with this, with this dream. He didn't know what it meant. He was afraid to, to hold out any type of hope. He's been there for a while. He's afraid. You know, that seems to me like that would say that I'm going to get back in the good graces of Pharaoh. It seems to me as, a, as if I'm going to get to serve Pharaoh again. But yet he's afraid to find that hope. But Joseph confirms it, and he says, this means that in three days, three more days, and Pharaoh will lift your head back to the place of prominence, that you will again stand before Pharaoh, and that you will again be able to, to be restored back into your good graces with Pharaoh. You will be serving him again. But then he says this in verse 14 and 15. He says, but remember me when it is well with you, and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh, and get me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here that they should put me into this dungeon. So... So here we see that, that Joseph gives him the interpretation. He says, you're going to get your opportunity to go back to Pharaoh, and you're going to get your opportunity to stand beside Pharaoh. But when you do, I want you to remember me. I want you to, to show me kindness. I want you to tell Pharaoh that I'm in here. I want you to tell Pharaoh that I have done nothing wrong, that I was kidnapped and I was sold and I was lied on and here I am and I'm in this bad situation because of nothing that I've done. I'm an innocent man. We'll see in a minute that he didn't do that. That we see that, that when this butler, he gets out of jail. Three days later, this butler is out of jail. He is taken and he is placed back in that place of prominence. He is, he is standing before Pharaoh. He stands beside Pharaoh. He's the one who hands Pharaoh his food. He's the one, in, in some, in some um, translations, it calls him the cupbearer because he's the one who actually hands his cup to Pharaoh. He, all trust is put in this man. He has the ear of Pharaoh. But he does not tell about Joseph. Now, let me tell you my theory on that. Let me tell you why I believe. Here is Joseph. Joseph, just like the rest of us. I know that Joseph doesn't give up hope. We know that Joseph remains faithful to God. But here in this moment... Joseph sees an opportunity. And where does he put his faith? In the butler. He takes this opportunity and he puts his, his chances in the hands of a man. He says, here's my opportunity. You're going to get to stand back before Pharaoh. And when you do, I'm going to put my faith that you're going to tell Pharaoh about me and that Pharaoh will bring me out of prison you see Joseph just for this moment put his faith in the butler he put his faith in Pharaoh he took his faith out of God at this moment and put it into a man and for that reason we know that for at least two more years Joseph remained in prison 
It wasn't his time. Now, I know that you're, you're, you're thinking, well, but, but wait a minute. I've read the rest of the story, and, 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 and the butler does tell, and that Pharaoh does bring him out. But we'll see that next week. It wasn't by Pharaoh's hand, and it wasn't by the butler's hand. It wasn't because Joseph asked. It was because of the situation that God creates. So we'll see that next week. But here we see that when he put his faith in man's hands, nothing changed for him. Then we see the, the, uh, the baker. You see, the baker gets happy. Here this butler, he just gave this, this, his, his, uh, his interpretation, and man, it, it seems good. It's, it's good that, that he's going to get to get out of here. So for that reason, that I'm going to give him, I'm going to tell him what my dream is. And he says, my dream is, is that I'm carrying these three baskets full of bread, and, these, and the birds are eating the bread out of these baskets. And I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to get out of here in three days too. But Joseph looks at him, he says, oh, man, that's bad. Because <sighs> in three days, your head too will be lifted up. But it'll be lifted up off your body as you're hanged on the tree. And when you're hanged on this tree, the birds are going to eat your flesh. Boy, can you imagine those, what those next three days would have been like for that baker? I can imagine that those three days for that baker would have been rough. Because he knew he was, he was told this bad news. Verse 20 says, Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of his chief baker among the servants. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted it to him. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. We see that the man let him down. We see that God interpreted the dreams. We see that Joseph, though, remained faithful. He told what he knew that God was translating. As we look at how these things relate and we see how the similarities between Joseph's life and we see the similarities between it and Jesus' life. I want to just point out a few of them. The first one is that we see that they were both thrown into a pit or into prison. At this point, we see Joseph being thrown into prison, but we also see Jesus as he's taken to Caiaphas' house. Now, I don't know if you understand, but in Caiaphas' house, a lot of what they used in those days were cisterns was what they would use for a prison. When the cistern, when, during the dry season, they would use their cisterns as prisons. Uh, and, and it's believed in, and, and actually got to see the, the cistern. And, and they, would, they actually had bars on their cisterns. But Jesus was held in the cistern in the, in the, uh, the house of Caiaphas. He was held in that prison overnight. So we know that they were both in prison wrongly. For, for, for nothing, they were both innocent, and they were both imprisoned. We also see that they were both condemned with two other people. These two other people, Jesus was condemned on the cross, and he hung beside two people. We see that Joseph was imprisoned beside two people. One was saved, and the other died. You see, we see the same thing with Jesus. He was on the cross with two men. One was saved... And one died to eternity. You see, the, the thief on the cross, one said, if you are the Son of God, then save yourself and save me too. And the other said, Lord, remember me when you enter your paradise. And we see that, that he was saved, the other died. We see here that the chief butler was saved and placed back into prominence. And we see that the baker, he died and then lastly, we see that they were both forgotten or denied. You see, Joseph stood before, asked this butler, he said, don't forget me. And he said, oh, I won't. But yet we see that he did forget him. He denied that he even knew. Now, why did he do that? We don't know. 
I have my theories. I, I believe that, that uh, he was afraid. He was afraid that if he brought it up, that he was in prison, that he would bring that reminder to the king. I, I think that he was f afraid of his own life. I think that he was afraid that if I remind the king that he was that angry with me once, that he might get that angry with me again. The same thing we see with Peter. He was in fear of his own life. He was, a, he was in fear of those around him. And for that reason, he, he acted as if he had forgotten or he denied who Christ was. So these are just a couple of the similarities that we see between Jesus and Joseph just in this short part of his story. But then also, the ways that we relate this to us. Folks, as we go through life, we can take so much out of this, out of this short story. Number one is we never give up on God. Listen, he, it may sometimes, your situation that you're in, the, the way, the place that you find yourself, you may feel like you're imprisoned. You may feel like you're, the, the world has closed in on you. You may feel like you're in a pit sometimes. And you may feel like God has forgotten you. You may feel like the world has forgotten you. Never give up on God. I can imagine that it would have been hard for Joseph. I can imagine that it would have been really easy for him to have said, God has forgotten me. I'm not going to do anything for him. I am in this position, and I've done nothing wrong. But Joseph never gave up on God. When he, when he saw that these dreams were there, he said, My God can interpret these dreams. He's in a position that you would think he would maybe give up on God. Folks, never give up. No matter how bad your situation seems, remember that God is still in control. Always live your life. Always live your life in a way that people know that God's hand is in your life. Some, even when you're facing a bad situation, when you're in a place like Joseph was, maybe it's health-wise, maybe it's work situation, maybe it's just family situation, but even in the worst of situations, when you continue to hold out hope, when you continue to be upbeat, when you continue to say, it is well with my soul, I love that song, and I'm glad we sung it this morning. But when you, even in the worst of times, you can say, it is well with my soul. People recognize, people notice, and you can affect the people around you because you live your life as if God's hand is on it. And then lastly, never put your trust in man. Now, I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't trust people with some stuff. Listen, don't put your trust for your life in the hands of man, even yourself. People will always let you down. I mean, we, we will. Even those of us, even if you have the best intentions, <laughs> even if you want to, to do everything right, there's just, we, we have limitations. We have fears. We have failures. But when you put your hands or your trust in a man or a woman, you stand the risk of being let down. But let me tell you, when you put your faith, when you put your trust in God, God will never let you down. He, is, he has a plan for you. He is, he is he's working it out. We don't know how it's going to happen. I don't, know, I don't know what God is doing in every one of your lives. I don't know what his plan for you is. But I promise you one thing. He does. He has a plan. He has a plan in every situation. And folks, when we put our trust and our faith in him, he will always work it out for good. Whatever your need is this morning, whatever you're facing in life, Whatever, whatever the world around you has brought you. Remember, God is in control. God has a plan for you. 
Always live. Always live for Him and never give up hope. As we stand this morning, as Matthew comes to lead us in a song, whatever is whatever's on your heart, whatever God's dealing with you about, whatever you're facing in life, put it in the hands of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for all that you do. We thank you, Lord, that you have your hand on our lives. We thank you, Lord, that we can still serve you. And, Lord, we just pray that you would just lead us and guide us and protect us and show us your will for each one of us. In your name we pray. Amen.